Welcome to your first lecture for Biology 107. This is Lecture 1, the Scientific Study of Life. This week we are going to be looking at the introduction to biology, uh, how we explore life using science. We're going to be covering Chapter 1. In this first lecture, we're specifically going to be covering Chapter 1, 1.1 uh, to 1.3. Three. And then in the second lecture, we're going to be looking at the process of science and the five unifying themes in biology. So the second lecture will cover 1.4 to 1.14. Now, since this is your first lecture, I have a couple of reminders for you. Now, use these lectures as a supplement to the rest of the course. Make sure you look through each lecture module and see all the different components. Remember, you're going to have some required readings for the week. You're gonna have these lectures. You're going to have your written discussion on science in our everyday lives. Then we're going to have our in-person Zoom discussions for science in our everyday lives. And you'll have a module quiz for each of the different weeks. These lectures are to be used as a supplement for that. So I wanna remind you that these lectures are what I think are most important that you know, but they're not everything that you will need to know. Make sure you also do the required readings, make sure you do the labs, and make sure you participate in the discussions. Especially for those discussions, you're going to need to be pulling on a lot more information than just what we cover in lecture. I'm going to expect that you've read the material, that you've done the homework, and that you, you know, are using the vocabulary and the concepts outside of just what we cover in lecture. You can pull from labs and everything. Also for the tests, uh, the lectures, like I said, are gonna cover what I think is most important. And when I write the tests, I usually test on what I think is most important. But the tests are going to pull from more than just lecture. They can also pull from your required readings. They can also pull from labs. So make sure you're doing all of the different assignments so you get a comprehensive overview of what we are actually studying. Um, at the end of each module, at the end of each lecture module, there is additional resources that include some online resources, some videos that you can watch if you would like more information uh, than what you get from the readings, the lab, and the lectures. Uh, so with that, let's jump right in to lecture one, the scientific study of life. So the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is, we're in a biology class, what is biology. So biology is the scientific study of life. Now if you're like, whew, oh good, I don't have to study any rocks because rocks are the worst. Biology is the study of life, but remember in order to have life, we need to have everything else. We need to have the rocks and the dirt and all the chemicals and everything like that. So while we are going to be studying life, in this class, we're also going to be studying all of the different non-living things that make life possible. And life is possible and life is amazing. Take a look at all of these different, weird, awesome things. Every time that I study biology, it's just incredible that all of these different things can exist and I hope that by the end of this class, you will have a better understanding and a better love for all of the different amazing forms of life that exist out there. A lot of which we don't even know exists yet. There's a lot that we don't know yet, which I think makes science and biology even more exciting. So all forms of life share some common properties and we're gonna take a look at these. So if you take a look, one of those properties is order. Right? There's not just disarray and chaos and everything. Things are the way they are for a certain reason. Right? And there's a highly ordered structure that typifies life. There's also growth and development. There's consistent growth and there's development. It's controlled by something called DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid, which we're going to study quite a bit in the upcoming lectures. There's also response to environment, the ability to respond to environmental stimuli. Think about if you're sitting and a bee comes and stings you. You're going to notice it, right? You're going to react to it. You're able to respond to your environment. And all living things are able to do this as well. There's also energy processing. 
Everything needs energy in order to survive. Organisms get energy in different ways, but all living things have to get energy somehow. So the use of chemical energy to power an organism's activities and chemical reactions is going to be consistent across all living things things or the need to do it is going to be consistent across all living things. Also, all living things need to reproduce, you know, like, like grandma says, the whole point of living is to have babies. Um, and in biology, that's actually kind of true. The whole point of life is to pass on your genes. Um, and so reproduction, right? If a species didn't have the ability to reproduce, it would be pretty pointless. And so all living things in order to be considered a species uh, has to be able to reproduce. There's also a lev uh, evolutionary adaptation. Uh, adaptations evolve over many generations and their traits, their behavioral or physical traits that help organisms survive in their environment. And we're gonna study adaptations quite a bit in later lectures, but I wanna plant the seed in your head right now that what's really important about adaptations is that we don't just make them. Right? I can't just decide to adapt my body right now. Adaptations happen by chance. Right? There's genetic mutations, there's different things that can happen, and all the offspring that are born are just a little bit different from one another, and some of them, by chance, are going to have adaptations that help them survive better than other organisms. And those ones are going to reproduce more, they're going to produce more offspring, and the next generation is going to have more of that specific adaptation because of that. So I wanna plant that little seed because that's gonna be really, really important in upcoming lectures. Um, but evolutionary adaptation, the ability to respond to the environment, and then regulation, the ability to control an organism's internal environment within the limits of sustained life. So all living things can only survive within a certain range of conditions. Think about if it were to get 160 degrees every single day, you would not be very comfortable organisms are the same way. They can only survive within a certain range of temperatures um, in different environmental conditions. And so how is it though that organisms are able to survive even within that range? And it's the ability to regulate themselves. Now you've probably heard of cold-blooded animals and warm-blooded animals. Cold-blooded animals are those ones that can't regulate their internal body temperature. Warm-blooded ones are the ones that can regulate their internal body temperature. Those terms are falling out of use, we typically now refer to them as ectothermic for cold-blooded, where they don't control their internal temperature, so they have to do things like lizards go lay on rocks to warm themselves up, and that's ectothermic. And then our warm-blooded creatures are usually called endothermic now, where they're able to control their internal environment. But it's more than just internal body temperature that organisms are able to control. They have to be able to keep all of the different systems operating within a certain range of conditions. You know, think of insulin levels and salt levels and all the different things we have in our body. Your body has to be able to control that, otherwise bad things happen. And that's another one of the major themes in biology. Now, life is organized into a hierarchy. And we start out really, really small, and we get bigger. And that's actually how this course is going to be organized over the entire semester. So we're going to start out super, super small with subatomic particles, and then we're going to put those subatomic particles together. And then we're going to put all those things together. We're going to put all those things together. And eventually we're going to keep building until we get all the way up to the biosphere, which is the biggest uh, level of hierarchy that we can study and that we have here on Earth. So we're going to go through each of those levels right now. And I'm going to tell you what that level is called and what it is. And then in parentheses, you'll see an example. And your challenge is to try to figure out what the next level example is going to be. Specifically, try to figure out at some point we're going to make an animal. So see if you can figure out which animal we're making as we build up. And then when we get past the actual animal, we're going to get into where it lives. See if you can figure that out as well. So see if you can kind of like guess one step ahead. So we're going to start with the smallest piece, oops, sorry, <laughs> which is a molecule. So our example here is DNA. So a molecule is a cluster of small chemical units called atoms that are held together by chemical bonds. Next week, we're actually gonna jump into what are atoms, what are they made up of, what are these chemical bonds? But for right now, just know that when we're looking at this hierarchy of life, 
our base unit here is going to be the molecule. And our example here is going to be DNA. You've heard that word before. DNA is going to be super important. You're going to learn all about it and you're going to learn to love it. Um, so molecule. Now, when you put a bunch of molecules together, they make an organelle. An organelle is a membrane enclosed structure that performs a specific function within a cell but we haven't gotten to cell yet. So we're not even up to the level of cell. We're still smaller than a cell. Our example of an organelle is the nucleus. And you might've heard of that. So the nucleus is part of a cell. If you put a bunch of organelles together, they make a cell. So a cell is the fundamental unit of life. And this is going to be super important. The smallest unit in this level of hierarchy that can be considered alive is the cell. And our example of a cell here is a nerve cell. And there's, there's lots of different types of cells, skin cells, um, you know, cells making up your stomach, nerve cells, all of that. Um, so our example here is gonna be nerve cell. Now, when you put a bunch of cells together, they are going to make a tissue. Tissue is a group of similar cells that perform a specific function. In our example, that's going to be nervous tissue. So you bunch of, put a bunch of nerve cells together, it's gonna make nervous tissue. Uh, now, when you put a bunch of tissues together, that's going to make an organ. An organ is a structure that's composed of many tissues. Uh, and here, our example is going to be the brain. So you put a bunch of organs together, and that's going to make an organ system. Uh, several organs that cooperate in a specific function. So here, it's going to be the nervous system. You could also have your digestive system, your endocrine system. There's all kinds of systems going on in the body, uh, but here we're gonna use the example of the nervous system. When you put a bunch of different organ systems together, like all those examples I just gave you, they're going to make, finally, an organism, which is an individual living thing, an animal, a plant, an algae. And in our example, did you guess it? Uh, we're at the American alligator. So let's go up to the next level. If you put a bunch of organisms together, that is going to make a population. So a population is all the individuals of one species that live in a specific area. And for our example, that's going to be all of the alligators that live in this specific wetland. Now, if you put a bunch of different populations together, remember each population is only comprised of one species. So if you put different populations or different species together that all live in the same area, that's known as a community. So that's all the different organisms from different species that are living in one area, which will be called the ecosystem. So in our example, it's all the organisms from the different species, plants, animals, algae that live in this wetland. If you put a bunch of different communities together, that's going to make an ecosystem, which is all of the organisms from all those different species that are living in a particular area. And at this level, the level of the ecosystem, we're also adding in the physical components with which the organisms interact. So now we don't just have our living things, we have all the different physical components that the organisms are going to need to survive. So now we have our Florida Everglades as our example. The next level up and you put all those ecosystems together, now we're at the biosphere, which is all of the environments on earth that support life. So there's your quick overview of the hierarchy of life from the smallest component to the biggest component. And again, over the course of the semester, we're gonna start small and we're gonna keep building every single week until we get all the way up to the biosphere at the very end of class. This is one of my favorite examples of life. Life is just amazing. There's so many different types. Look at all the interactions that are going on. And all of these different interactions are gonna be really crucial to the study of life. Now at each of those different levels that we just talked about, there's what we call emergent properties. So at each of those levels, when we go from you know, an organ to an organ system, there's going to be what's called emergent properties, properties that didn't exist at the level that came before it. So emergent properties, the definition is new properties that arise in each step upward in the hierarchy. So when you go up each one of those levels um, from the arrangement and interactions among component parts. So again, emergent properties are basically new properties in one of those levels of hierarchy that you didn't see in the previous levels of hierarchy. 
And then systems biology is the study of a biological system and the modeling of its dynamic behavior, ranging from the functioning of the biosphere to the complex molecular machinery of an organelle. It basically means that systems biology is the study of how all of these different things work together. Because I mentioned interactions are going to be super important. They're going to play a big role in evolution. And so in systems biology, we're actually studying how all those different things, all those different levels, all the different components work together. So let's take a moment to talk about cells, because I mentioned earlier that cells are going to be the smallest unit that can be considered alive. And we're going to spend a lot of this class, like not just a specific lecture, but we're going to spend a lot of Bio 107 talking about cells, because cells are super, super important as the fundamental unit of life. So cells are the structural and functional units of life. Without cells, life wouldn't exist. A cell can regulate its internal environment. I mentioned why that's important earlier. It can take in and use energy. It can respond to its environment. It can develop and maintain its complex organization and it can give rise to new cells. It can reproduce. So if you notice, those are all the hallmarks of life. All cells are enclosed by a membrane that helps to regulate the passage of material between the cell and its surroundings. So they have some kind of membrane, some kind of, you know, envelope, cell wall, something that surrounds the cell that only lets certain things in and certain things out. And all cells use DNA as their genetic information. There's that word again, DNA. We're going to talk about it quite a bit. Cells also illustrate a really important theme in biology that we're going to talk a little bit about in the next lecture, which is the correlation of structure and function. So the reason that things are shaped like they are, why their structure is like they are, is for a reason. Uh, you know, they have a specific structure because they perform a specific function. Um, you know, take a look, take a look at your thumbs. Why do your thumbs look like this? You know, it's not just for funsies, it's because they need to be able to grab things. You know, we have opposable thumbs that do this for a reason. That's structure and function. And structure is related to function at all levels of biological organization. And so whenever you're looking at a new strange creature, you can actually tell quite a bit about it, even if you've never seen it before, uh, seen it before just by looking at its different structures. You know, if you see a bird with a long skinny beak, you can probably guess that it's going to be picking tiny little seeds or grubs or something out of the ground. Or if you see a bird with a big wide beak, it's probably going to be eating something a little bit bigger that it needs to be scooping up. And so you can actually tell quite a bit about the function about what an organism does just by looking at the structure of the different components of its body. And that holds true not just for things on your body, but even when you're looking at cells or subatomic particles. This holds true for all the different hierarchies, uh, the levels of hierarchy in life. And there are two basic types of cells. There are prokaryotic cells and there are eukaryotic cells. In evolutionary history, prokaryotic cells came first. When things come first, they're typically smaller and less complex because you can imagine that things typically get more complex over time as more and more adaptations get added on. So prokaryotic cells came first. They're typically small and they're typically very simple. We're gonna take a look at a picture in just a minute. This is compared to eukaryotic cells. So we had prokaryotic cells first and eventually some of them evolved into what we now call eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are typically larger than prokaryotic cells. They're typically more complex than prokaryotic cells. And eukaryotic cells are what you are probably thinking of when you think of a cell. So the cells that we find in plants, animals, fungi, protists, ourselves, are eukaryotic cells. So when you think of a cell, if you're thinking of you know, a nucleus and all of these different little pieces of a cell, you're thinking of a eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotic cells are divided into different membranes, functional compartments, also known as organelles, 
including the nucleus, which houses the DNA. So if you take a look at these pictures, if you look in the upper right hand corner, you'll see it looks kind of like a little grain of rice with a purple dot inside. That's actually a prokaryotic cell. So you'll notice that it does have a membrane around the outside that only allows some things in and some things out. It does also have DNA. So prokaryotic cells do have DNA, but in a prokaryotic cell, that DNA is not housed in a nucleus. It does tend to kind of bunch up in a nucleoid region, which you can see here that the DNA is kind of bunched into one area, but it's not actually enclosed into a nucleus. Now compare that to the eukaryotic cell, which is this really big cell that you'll see here. You'll notice the eukaryotic cell is a lot bigger than the prokaryotic cell. You'll also notice there's a lot more going on in the eukaryotic cell. So you'll notice there's all these different organelles, which we're gonna study in a couple of weeks. Uh, you're gonna learn all about what all these different things are, uh, but there's lots of different organelles that do different functions within the eukaryotic cell. You'll notice eukaryotic cell does have DNA, and one of the main things that sets the eukaryotic cells apart from the prokaryotic cells is that eukaryotic cells have their DNA enclosed in a nucleus. A membrane enclosed nucleus houses the DNA in eukaryotic cells. Now, all of these different variations lead to a really great diversity of life. You know, I showed you some great pictures earlier. Think of the kelp forest, all the different colors, all the different organisms. There's so much diversity in life. There's so much difference in life and it's all really, really beautiful. Even when it's ugly, I think it's beautiful. Um, so we're gonna take a little look at the diversity of life. Now, the diversity of life can be arranged into three what we call domains. Think of these as like big overarching buckets that we could take any living thing anywhere on earth and it could be classified into one of these three buckets, which we call domains. Now, if you're my age or older, when you were learning about taxonomy about like how to place plants and animals and all of that in school, domains weren't a thing. You might be remembering like, I remember doing kingdoms, but not domains. That's because domains weren't really a thing when we were younger, but they are now. Um, we realized that we actually needed more general buckets than kingdoms. And so we came up with these three domains. So the three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Now I'm going to give you a little, a little hint here. Bacteria and archaea are both made up of prokaryotes. And a lot of instructors, probably not me, we'll see, but probably not me, um, like to try to trick you and talk about domain prokarya. There is not a domain prokarya. It does not exist. There is a domain eukarya, but there's not a domain prokarya. Domain bacteria and domain archaea are both made up of prokaryotes. And then we also have domain eukarya, which is made up of all the eukaryotes. So let's take a look, just a brief look at these three different domains. So bacteria are the most diverse and widespread prokaryotes. And you've probably heard of bacteria, right? Some of them make us sick, but there's tons of different types of bacteria. They're very, very simple organisms that have been around forever. We've also known about bacteria for a very, very long time because humans got very interested in studying disease. You know, they wanted to figure out why people were getting sick. And so bacteria have been known to science for a long time. And even though they're rapidly evolving and we're still doing a lot of study on bacteria, we know a lot about bacteria. Now compare that to the other prokaryotic domain, which is domain archaea. Archaea are also prokaryotes but these are relatively new to science. Now don't get that confused, they're not new. Archaea have been around forever, but we've only known about them for the past several decades. That's because unlike bacteria, bacteria live everywhere, right? There's bacteria everywhere you look, even if you can't see it. Archaea only live in extreme environments. So think of things like hydrothermal vents, which are those cracks in the earth's crust, like way, way, way down deep, in the ocean. Uh, think of like really hot pools, really cold areas. That's where archaea like to live. So they live in places that humans typically don't 
go, which is why even though they've been around forever, we haven't known about them very long. They're also what we call extremophiles, which just means that they live in really extreme environments. So if you were to be asked a question uh, describing an organism and it said something like this organism and gave you some weird scientific name, uh, has DNA, but DNA is not enclosed in a membrane bound nucleus and it's relatively new to science found at hydrothermal vents. Which domain is it in? Even knowing nothing about that organism, you should be able to place it in a domain. Okay, well, it doesn't have a nucleus, which means it has to be either domain bacteria or domain archaea, and it's relatively new to science, lives in extreme environments, so it must be in domain archaea. So you can make that connection there. Uh, so those are the two prokaryotic domains, domain bacteria and domain archaea. The third domain is domain eukarya. And again, these are all of the eukaryotic cells. So these are the ones that you probably typically think of when you think of cells. Uh, so single-celled protists all the way up to multicellular fungi, animals, and plants all fall under domain eukarya. So if you wanted to put us humans in a bucket, we would be in domain eukarya. Now, diversity is the hallmark of life. Biologists have identified over 1.8 million species, and that's just a fraction of what actually exists. There are a ton of species that we don't even know about. Using mathematical models, we can guess that there's somewhere between 10 million to 100 million species, but we will probably likely never know that for sure because we're never gonna find all the species that are out there. So lots of different species and they're all very, very different from one another. But we, want, we like to classify them, right? Humans like to classify things. We like to figure out how things work, put them in some kind of order. And this order, this classifying of organisms into all of these different buckets and different hierarchies is called taxonomy. So if you take a look, I have a picture here, uh, the most broad, is going to be at the very top. So you'll notice here it's domain. And then with each level down, we're going to get more specific. So if we're looking at one specific line, say we're looking at phylum, everything in that phylum is going to be in the same kingdom in the same domain. Uh, we're just gonna get more specific as we go down. So if you start at the very top, the most general category that we classify things in is domain. Then we're gonna get a little more specific. Then we go to kingdom, we get more specific, we go to phylum, more specific, we go to class, then order, then family, then genus, then species, and some scientists even use subspecies. So if we take a look at the example of this red fox, the red fox is in domain eukarya. So again, super, super broad category. It's placed in there with all the other eukaryos that exist. So now we're gonna get a little more specific. The fox itself is placed into kingdom Animalia or the animal kingdom, right? So now we've excluded the plant kingdom and some of the algaes and stuff and we're just in the animal kingdom. So a little more specific, but still fairly general. So now we're going to get more specific and we're going to get to phylum. The plural of that is phyla with an A at the end. And the fox is in phylum chordata. So now we're in the chordate, so it's animals with a backbone also known as vertebrates. So we're getting more specific. We've now excluded all the invertebrates, which is a lot. There's a lot of invertebrates out there. Now we're gonna get more specific and go down to class. We're in class mammalia, which are the mammals. So we're now we're excluding everything that's not a mammal. We're gonna go down one more to order. And this is an order carnivora, which are the carnivores, the meat eaters. We're gonna go down to family, which is canidae, which are the dogs. Go down even more, genus plural, that is genera, um, in vulpes, and then species is vulpes, vulpes, that's the red box, vulpes, vulpes. Um, if we talk about a scientific name, we're typically referring to the genus and the species. Um, so here it's vulpes, vulpes. Um, but you can classify everything like this if you know enough about it. Um, you might remember this cute little saying, King Philip came over four great snacks. People, get your minds out of the gutter. Uh, that helps you remember this order. Um, so if you take a look, kingdom, king, Philip, starts with a P, phylum, came, starts with a C, class, 
over, starts with an O for order, for great snacks. So King Philip came over for great snacks. Uh, take the first letter of each. It'll help you remember what the, the taxonomy order is here, hopefully. Okay, so that's the end of lecture one. Let's review what we've gone over. So remember that biology, the whole reason that we're here this semester, is the scientific study of life. And all forms of life share some common properties. Order, growth and development, response to environment, regulation, evolutionary adaptation, energy processing, and reproduction. There's a hierarchy to life. There's different levels of organization to life. New properties emerge at each level. And we're gonna start at our smallest piece, which is the molecule. You put all the molecules together, that makes an organelle. Put the organelles together, makes a cell. Cell goes to tissue, tissue goes to organ. Organ goes to organ system, which goes to organism, to population, to community, to ecosystem, to biosphere. Cells are the structural and functional units of life. So cells are the smallest unit that can actually be considered alive. They're the smallest unit uh, that has all of those different properties that we talked about earlier, properties that you need to be considered alive. And the diversity, the amazing diversity of life can be arranged into three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So in the next lecture, we're going to move on to the process of science. So how do you science? You know, how do we know all of these things? How do we know about life? So when you're ready, move on to the next lecture where we're going to be looking more at biology and how we study it. <laughs>